Welcome everyone, Alex Tabrock here. Today we're going to be looking at rent seeking and why it's so bad for the economy. Just a note on terminology, rent seeking like corruption is a non-productive activity which takes from the productive side of the economy. Rent seeking doesn't have to be illegal, however. We can think about creating a cartel or a monopoly or a tariff or a tax. These could all be types of rent seeking which take from the productive side of the economy and are themselves unproductive. Rent seeking would also include theft and other corrupt activities, but is not necessarily itself corrupt. Okay, let's take a look at a model. So our model is based on one created by Kevin Murphy, Andre Schleifer, and Robert Vishny, three famous economists, in a paper called Why is Rent Seeking So Costly to Growth? And the very basic idea is going to be that rent seeking can drive out productive activities in a way that is self-fulfilling. There'll be a kind of snowball effect. So there'll be a good equilibrium, which is stable, but if you hit a tipping point, we're going to show that you can be driven way down here to the bad equilibrium. And the bad equilibrium is very bad, and once you're down here, it's hard to climb your way back out. It's going to be hard to climb your way back out. That's going to be the basic idea of the model. Let's take a closer look. So we're going to have a model of a developing economy in which there are three uh, activities, things you can do. First, you can produce a cash crop. That is, produce a crop for market sale. This is where you're going to get money for your crop. We might think, for example, about producing coffee. This is a productive thing to do. You're going to make lots of money. You're going to be given cash. You're not going to consume the coffee yourself. Perhaps it's even for export. The second thing you can do is to go into subsistence production. As you can produce for your own family or produce a crop that will feed you but has negligible market value. So you can produce potatoes, for example. There's no real market for the potatoes. You're just going to consume them yourself. It's enough to keep you going, keep you in subsistence. But you're not going to sell these potatoes on the market. You're not going to get cash for them. The third thing you can do is you can go to the capital and you can rent seek. You can tax, you can steal, you can create cartels and so forth which enable you to take from the producers of the cash crop. Notice, you can take cash, but you cannot rent seek from the subsistence farmers. And this is because it's easier to steal the cash than it is to steal the potatoes. The rent seekers, they don't even want the potatoes. You know, they want cash, they want money. You can't really take very much from these subsistence farmers. But you can take from the people producing the coffee, the cash crop. You can take their money, it's much easier. So it's much easier to rent-seek from the cash crop. And the key idea is going to be that rent-seeking pushes the returns to the cash crop down. And in particular, the more people who enter the rent-seeking sector, the lower the returns to producing the cash crop. Okay, let N be the number of rent-seekers, and then let's take a look at what can happen in this model. So our first case is going to be the simplest case, the property rights are well protected case. This will help us to understand the basic mechanics of the model. Notice on the horizontal axis down here, we have the number of rent seekers. On the vertical axis, we have the returns or the rewards to the different types of activities, to being a producer, to going into subsistence farming, or to being a rent seeker here in red. Now notice that if, if there are zero rent seekers, then the return to production is very high up here. Forget that it says good equilibrium for the moment. Just notice that with zero rent seekers, the return to production is very high. And because property rights are well protected, the return to rent seeking is low. So it costs a lot in this, in this case to steal money from the productive sector of the economy. Now imagine that the number of rent seekers increases. So as the number of rent seekers increases, the returns to the productive side of the economy fall, okay, and they continue to fall until they are equal to the subsistence return. At this stage, people say, okay, I'm going to leave the cash crop. So much is being stolen from me. It's just not worth it anymore. I'm going to go into producing potatoes instead, subsistence farming. For the rent seekers... Their returns stay constant as the number of rent seekers increase until you hit the subsistence farming. This is because as you get more rent seekers, they can continue to take 
from the cash crop side of the economy. Each one of them gets a chunk of that cash crop side of the economy. But once you have people entering, entering subsistence farming, the return to rent seekers falls. Okay. Now, the equilibrium in this model is pretty simple. Because the returns to being a producer, the rewards to being a pr producer, exceed the rewards to rent seeking, there's no reason to be a rent seeker. So everybody ends up being a producer, and you end up here in the good equilibrium. This is the good case, the great case. Everyone is working in the most productive sector of the economy, the cash crop sector. We don't have any rent seekers because it pays more to be a coffee grower than it does to be a coffee stealer. Okay, what else can happen? Case two, in, in a way, is the diametrically opposite case. This is the case where property rights are very weakly protected. So in this case, it's so easy to be a rent seeker that the returns to rent seeking exceed the returns to being a producer. As a result, the number of rent seekers increases, and it continues increasing until we reach the bad equilibrium. So what happens here is you get more and more rent seekers, the returns to the productive side of the economy fall until you reach the subsistence return, then you still get more and more people entering the subsistence economy until the returns to rent seeking equal the returns to subsistence, which equal the returns in the cash sector of the economy. So here we may have all three sectors uh, operating. The rent seekers are taking from the cash sector of the economy, leaving the people in the cash sector with just a subsistence return. There's no incentive for people in the cash sector any longer to switch to subsistence farming because subsistence farming is paying the same return. Also, there's no incentive to go from potatoes to coffee because, again, you get the same return. There's also no more incentive to enter the rent-seeking sector because they have driven the economy to such a low level that everyone is making the bad return. Nobody, whether they're in the cash crop sector of the economy, the rent-seeking sector, or the subsistence sector, nobody is making a good return. Everyone's making the potato return, the subsistence return. This is the bad equilibrium. And here we have the third case, which is perhaps the most interesting. In this case, if you don't have very many rent seekers, then everything is okay because the returns to being a producer exceed the returns to being a rent seeker, and you end up in the good equilibrium. However, suppose that for random reasons, perhaps there's a war, perhaps there's some kind of shock, we get an increase in rent seeking. If we get an increase in rent seeking enough which pushes us over this tipping point, then all hell breaks loose. Because if we push over the tipping point, the returns to rent seeking will exceed the returns to being a producer, and very quickly, we're going to be driven down here to the bad equilibrium. Also, notice that if you get into the bad equilibrium, it can be really hard to get back out again. You've really got to reduce rent seeking a lot get rid of a lot of rent seekers, transfer all of these rent seekers back into the productive side of the economy. That's going to be difficult. It may require uh, very strict uh, uh, changes in the laws, very tough changes in the laws, because if you make just small changes, okay, you reduce ease of being a rent seeker just a little bit, well, then you're still going to have the rent seeking returns are going to be bigger than the returns in the productive sector of the economy, and you're going to be driven back to this bad equilibrium. We've got so many people in that sector of the economy, it's hard to get them all out, to switch them, switch them in a big push to get you back into the good equilibrium. I also think about this part of the model as being a little bit like the Atlas Shrugged model. So in Ayn Rand's novel, uh, Atlas Shrugged, the rent seekers are getting more powerful over time. The looters and the moochers, as Ayn Rand would have put it, are getting more powerful. You're getting all these laws so the kind of this curve is shifting up like this, putting you closer and closer to the tipping point, getting that tipping point closer and closer until finally you tip over and you end up in the bad equilibrium uh, where all the good guys now, all the entrepreneurs, the people who were creating all of the wealth, uh, they end up going to Galt's Gulch. Uh, they end up leaving the economy. So you can also think about the subsistence return as not being the potato sector, but you can think about the productive sector being the innovative sector, the high-tech, innovative, advanced sector, the new sector, the new ideas sector, and the subsistence return 
as being the less entrepreneurial, the non-entrepreneurial sector. And as the rent seeking goes up, as you get more and more rent seeking, you may hit that tipping point and then people leave the entrepreneurial sector, they leave entrepreneurship, they go to Galt's culture, they become ordinary workers and you get into the bad equilibrium. This model has another interesting, uh, interesting aspect. Suppose that uh, the returns to being a producer go up. So perhaps coffee prices uh, go up or perhaps there is a greater technological change, there's more innovation, and that increases the returns in the productive sector of the economy. We'll notice that that pushes the tipping point way far to the right. Okay? It pushes you beyond perhaps where you're going to get for random reasons. So this says that an increase in economic growth or an increase in the productivity of your export sector, your coffee sector, your cash sector, this actually has two good things to it. First of all, just because it means higher returns, that's better, but also good times means it's easier to keep the rent seekers at bay. Simply by raising the return in the productive side of the economy, you reduce the return from being a rent seeker. So it's kind of a double benefit. There's a political benefit as well as an economic benefit. This is why you typically notice that when things are good, they're very good. So when the economy is booming, you often have good politics. On the other hand, when the economy falters, when the returns to being a producer fall, so we have a situation more like this, and those returns to being a producer fall, then you even get the worst you get the worst of all worlds the economy falls at the same time you get more people into rent seeking so the bad times are really bad the good times however are really good another way of putting that is you want to make sure that your rent seeking returns are always low because you don't want to fall into that tipping point because it's going to be really hard to get bad back and if the good times get a little bit worse get do get worse for some random reason you want to make sure you don't fall over that tipping point so you've got to keep those rent-seeking returns uh, low at all times. Okay, let's sum up. So here are three cases, the strong property rights case, the weak property rights case, and really the one which we're in, the multiple equilibria case. And as we saw, there's lots of good lessons here about staying in that good equilibrium, keeping those rent-seeking returns low, how good times reinforce good politics, how bad times reinforce bad politics and the importance of keeping out of that bad equilibrium. Thanks.